Unity ECS received a fairly moderate update a few weeks ago, which simplifies a lot of the way that we do things in the API, specifically when it comes to the transform systems. This unfortunately has the side effect of breaking a lot of things, especially if you use the transform aspect quite heavily, which I showcased in some of my previous tutorial videos. So anyways, in today's video, I wanna talk about this update a little bit more, as well as some other miscellaneous news items that I haven't talked about on this channel, such as Unity's brand new CTO, what that may mean for the future of Dots, as well as a few updates on some cool events happening up. And one thing that I totally forgot to mention in my previous video that I did on my GDC recap. Um, so why don't you go ahead and kick off this video with that. So during GDC, Unity hosted a talk dedicated to working with their new multiplayer tools. It was a really excellent talk and the replay is now available for you to watch online. And at the very end of it, they did have a major announcement, which I totally forgot about. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Dots Mega City, the you know giant futuristic cyberpunk looking city where you have the flying car that kind of goes throughout the whole uh, giant massive city. And it was kind of the initial introduction to Dots that was showcased at a Unite event a couple years back. So the big announcement was now that there was going to be a heavy emphasis on netcode for entities, Unity wanted to create a sample project for that. So they created a multiplayer version of the Mega City demo and it's going to be available to us sometime soon. I uh, didn't have a date, it just said coming soon as of right now, but it's basically a multiplayer version of Mega City where you and 64 plus of your friends can all join into the Mega City and all fly around in it together. So I'm of course very much looking forward to playing around with that one when it comes out. Uh, again, do not have any timelines on when that will be ready though. And a little sidebar, I was actually talking to one of the developers who created this sample project and they're basically telling me that you know they had the Mega City already and they were able to fairly easily add in multiplayer after the fact. So I definitely think that that's, you know, kind of a cool and interesting sign that, you know, they had this fully developed project that had initially been developed many years ago and now upgraded to a 1.0 version and they're able to essentially just tack on multiplayer on top of it. So I think that's really cool. And speaking of sample projects, another one that we talked about during the showcase was the new URP sample scenes. There's actually three different sample scenes that showcase kind of different things that can be done using the universal render pipeline. I think these are some really cool looking sample projects. It's going to be a good reference to build, you know, cool and interesting effects and showcase, you know, ways that we can achieve specific looks in our different games. This is another one of those things that's just coming soon as of right now, um, but definitely hope to be getting hands on with those very, very soon. And so speaking of events, Unity recently announced that they're going to be hosting their annual Unite event this year in Amsterdam. It's going to be taking place November 15th and 16th in the lovely city of Amsterdam. Obviously, this event is still several months away, so nothing's guaranteed right now, um, but would definitely like to get out to Amsterdam for this event. I think it would be a great time. Now, if you don't want to wait until November for a game dev event, don't worry because Jason Wyman is going to be putting on an event the first week of May from the 1st to the 5th. It's the Game Dev Guild Conference, which he originally did last year, and I did a talk at that event last year, and I'm happy to announce that I'm going to be doing another talk at this event this year. Um, so my topic this year is going to be modular data-oriented design. Of course, many times when data-oriented design and dots and ECS are all brought up, typically they're talking about you know high performance, you know how can we get the most performance out of our games. Now what I wanna focus on in this talk is how using data-oriented design really lends your code to be much more modular. So you can easily swap things in and out, add complexity, um, you know, a lot of really cool things with that. I'm gonna be talking about some general things and going into some specific examples on how to actually practically do this. And so tickets are on sale right now. I will have some links down in the description where you can go ahead and purchase your tickets. So just before GDC, it was announced that Unity now has a new CTO. The previous CTO, Yawakam Ante, who has been at the company since its inception, he was one of the founders of Unity, um, has stepping down from his position and his replacement is Luke Bartholet. Luke has been in the games industry for a very long time now, doing a lot of things at EA, going back to the original Sims and SimCities games, and was heavily involved with the technical side of developing these games. He's also been at Unity for the past four or five years now, so he's not brand new to the company. But after this blog post was released, there was a little bit of concern from the public because in the blog post, it didn't mention the previous CTO, Joachim Ante, at all. That was basically just kind of talking about the new CTO and his kind of overall direction for the company. Another point of contention that some people may have noticed is that in that blog post, it didn't mention anything about DOTS or ECS. And you would think that, you know, maybe as the new CTO that you would kind of want to talk a little bit more about some of these technical aspects coming to the Unity game engine. Now, despite this, I don't think there's any reason for concern right now. Uh, one thing that I did actually notice on LinkedIn is that it shows that he's actually been the CTO since October, but it sounds like it was just recently announced of this transition. 
Um, one other thing that I picked up on at GDC was that Yoakamante actually had heavy involvement in determining who the new CTO was going to be. And of course, Yoakamante has been heavily involved in the development of DOTS and ECS. So that's most likely something that's kind of near and dear and important to him. And so I'm sure that he wouldn't promote some CTO who didn't you know, share at least some level of passion for it. And again, going back to looking at some of the games that Luke has worked on, if you look at The Sims and SimCity, you know, a lot of these games, you're dealing with, you know, potentially lots of dynamic entities. And from what I've at least heard from some people is that some of these Sims games from the early days were actually built off of an entity component system type solution. So although these things weren't necessarily brought up in the blog post, I don't think these are any necessarily valid reasons to be concerned at this point. Now, I did think that it was kind of funny at the end of that blog post that he did call out that he watches uh, Jason Wyman and Code Monkey on YouTube. So that's pretty cool. So shout out to Jason Wyman and Code Monkey. <laughs> Okay, so getting into some more of the DOTS specific things. So one thing that I wanted to bring up was the rival character controller. So uh, many of you will remember the rival character controller it was on the asset store. It was for sale for a while. And then at one point, Unity announced that they basically acquired the asset and that it was going to be you know, part of the Unity game engine. So kind of during this transitionary period, it was available on the asset store as a free asset that you could basically download and import into your project. Um, but now that actually has been removed so you can no longer download it through the asset store because you can download it directly through the package manager. All you need to do is open up the package manager, do add package by name, and then you'll just type in com.unity.charactercontroller and then it's gonna go ahead and download the full character controller project files into your project. Also, you can go over the samples tab and download some of the prefab assets through there. And they do have some of the demo scenes available to download off of wow. GitHub. Okay, so next up, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the recent ECS update. So this is version 1.0.0 pre-release 65. Like I mentioned earlier, this simplifies a lot of things in the API, a lot of things related to the transform system and just some other kind of random things. Now, unfortunately, this ends up breaking a lot of things that I did in some of my previous tutorial videos, specifically the big two and a half hour zombies tutorial that I made. And so because there have been so many changes recently, I actually created a blog post basically detailing out all the changes and what you need to modify from the original tutorial version to the now upgraded version. So I have that available and I have it linked off on that main video. I'll have some links down in the description if you wanna go directly to that though. So anyways, just kind of main highlights on this update. Um, the transform aspect has now been removed. The idea is that it kind of simplified a lot of things because there previously were a bunch of different components that were associated with the transform system. So now basically you just have a local transform component, which is where you have your position, rotation, scale, and all that. And then you have your local to world component, which actually tells the rendering engine where it should be rendered. And so because of this, it makes the transform aspect kind of redundant because basically you would be using that for pretty much the same things that you would be able to do with the local transform component. So the idea now is that you just modify the local transform component directly. And it's gonna go ahead and take care of any, you know, hierarchical conversions and everything like that to calculate the local to world component. And so for most of the times that I was using it, especially in the zombies project, it was basically just as simple as removing the transform aspect and replacing it with the local transform. Another thing that has changed, which is a quite interesting addition, is to the different add component, add buffer, and all those types of you know add methods, where basically we define what the conversion process looks like of taking a game object and converting it into an entity, you know, when we're gonna go ahead and add components to that entity. Previously, we could just basically do an add component and then pass in the component type, or if we wanted to say, you know, assign some specific values, we could define what values that we wanted in there. Now these methods are actually considered obsolete because now we actually have to pass in the entity that we're going to be adding these components onto. Now this is kind of interesting why they want to do this because when we define our entity, we can actually associate some transform usage flags with them. So basically this kind of defines which transform components do we want on our resulting entity. So for example, let's just say we had some regular dynamic entity like a player that we would want to move around in the world and all that. Well, in one of our bakers for this player, we can go ahead and set the transform usage flags to dynamic, which means it's going to add all the basic default transform components to that 
outputted entity. And with all these transform components, we could move this object through the world and everything no problem. Now let's say we have something in our world that's gonna be completely stationary like a rock. It's just gonna be sitting there. Um, it's not gonna be moving, but we still want it somewhere physically in our world. Well, we can set our transform usage flags to static, meaning that we're actually not going to get a local transform component. We're just going to get a local to world component. Now what this means is that we do not have that local transform component, so we can't actually move it around in the world. However, we still do have that local to world component so the game engine knows where to render it in the world. And also if we had say an entity that we want to be a data only entity, if we want say maybe some certain properties for an algorithm that we're utilizing, but there's nothing about that entity that needs to physically live somewhere in the world, well, we can set the transform usage flags to none and it's not going to get any transform components at all. So another slight change, but it is pretty cool because we can have a lot more control about you know, what our resulting entity is going to be, meaning that we can really optimize data and we don't end up with a bunch of extra extra data components that we're not even gonna end up using. Anyways, that's gonna do it for today's video. If you have any questions or comments for me, feel free to leave those down in the comment section below or join us over on Discord over at tmg.dev slash Discord. Don't forget to sign up for your two week free trial to Aura using the link down in the description below. Anyways, I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day and I'll see you in the next one.